Speaking of getting carried away, a lot of people are getting carried away in the aftermath of Anthony Joshua's resounding defeat to Daniel Dubois at Wembley last weekend. A lot of people are now calling Anthony Joshua to retire. If Anthony Joshua has still got it anymore, just from a trainer's perspective, from what you saw, what was your take from that fight and the potential rebuild AJ's got in front of him now? He doesn't need to rebuild. Um, he just needs to win the rematch if you know if they can get it. I said it in an interview yesterday that you know I, I don't believe that doing a rebuild process has done anything for him in the past. I don't know, like it's just lining his pockets, but he's he's got his pockets lined. It's just putting more miles on the clock by going through hard training camps and for the inevitable to happen to fight for the big fights. And if you get it wrong, then there's no change, you know, because only fighting subpar opposition can just make you complacent. Um, and we all know that he's a he's a world level fighter. You don't become a two eight, a two time world champion if you're not a, a world class fighter. Um, he has world class vulnerabilities though, but he's also got world class power, and that's what makes that's what makes him bo box office. That's what made George Groves box office because it was like okay, he's got the power to knock people out, but also he can get hurt. You know, that's what the that's the entertainment business. Um, he would not have been so confident going into that camp, that fight, if he, if, you know, if he was shot, mm. you know, if he, if she, if he should retire. Like physically, he's still got it. You know, he's 30, about to turn thirty-five years of age. But like mentally, he needs work, like himself. But he also has to have confidence in people around him, um, and and just like, and that fearless mentality. You know. Um, so it's just down to how he what he wants from his life. You know, he's he's made generational money. Like his fat is he doesn't have to work a day in his life. His kids don't have to work a day in their life. Like you know, they can follow their passion and dreams, and that's what he set out to achieve from when he started boxing to to make sure him and his family change their life for good. And he's done that. Um, but he clearly loves fighting. Hence the reason he still wants to continue. Um, but you know. We're in it to watch the best versus the best. There's a reason why we've got world titles. We want to see the best people versus the best. We don't want to see if you said right now, okay, like let's take let's we we watch James Tony versus Roy Jones Jr. when they were in their pomp. Like, let's watch that shit again. But they're like, you know, no one wants to see that. No one's gonna pay to see that. We wanna see them when they're in their in their physical prime. And Tyson Fury rolled back the clock. In the Usyk fight, I thought it was one of the best performances he's put in in a long time. Mm. I, I looked at him versus Chisora and Dylan White, and I thought, ah, he's slipping a little bit here. And there was rumours that he wasn't performing in camp, but he turned it round. And AJ has got it to turn around. He's still physically there. It's just about figuring out what you're doing it for, you know, and then figuring out the repercussions of your actions and you can't fight a certain way you know, it's world class fight and you've got to be you've got to be on it. There's in the fallout there's a clip of you on BBC Five Live talking through the commentary and you giving your analysis and you were you gave a suggestion there that the uppercut wasn't the right move at that point in time to, to go for now. Uh, can you break down uh, from a trainer's perspective as to why that I, I don't need to break it down. It just it is what it is. It's just it's pretty evident. I mean I said it in the in the I listened to the instructions and I just voiced my opinion mm -hmm. and the dangers of looking for specific shots. Um, and yeah, I mean, it just, it just happened that way, but um, yeah. Could you just from a technical point, what, why was the uppercut not the right shot to throw in that situation? If you ask that question, you shouldn't be doing this job. In that sense, <laughs> I'm, I am I mean? a layman. I'm definitely not, yeah, a, no, not but, an expert uh, boxer. Well, I don't need to explain it. It's just, you know, like it, it's just, just, just the way it is. Yeah, don't want to educate everybody. Fair enough. Um, just for the future, then, for a potential rematch uh, for AJ, like, how big are the changes then that would have to be made uh, from his offensive or defensive point of view to? change the victory the second time, or change the outcome the second time around? Um, I, I believe he can win the fight. It's just he has to, he has to box a specific way 
and um, yeah, just got to get the right the right approach. So um, it's just whether he can he believes it, and he's got the right people to te to teach it, and also get the right sparring uh -huh. and condition himself. You know what I mean? Because habits are formed in the gym. Mm. There's habits that were presenting themselves throughout that fight and they're formed in the gym. They're formed not, you don't just, it just like you choreograph things time and time again in, tr in training that when you get in there, it's just second nature. You don't, even if you're buzz and hurt, you're still so conditioned and so choreographed that you don't make fundamental flaws like that, that, you know, um, that he was making. So I, d you know, I don't think that's what I'm saying. Like dropping yourself to subpar competition create bad habits mm. we focus on AJ there what what of Daniel just how good was he and um, I imagine like you kind of saw Daniel kind of growing into mm. uh, what he's become now uh, and having moments like this having seen him and worked with him uh, for so long in the gym here um, how much has he progressed and since leaving you and going with Don yeah I mean like when when he come to the gym he just didn't understand what what an intensity he needed to train at. Like it was so far off the mark. Like um, he could punch with speed, but he could punch with speed for like one or two shots and it would exhaust him. And this was after the Joe Joyce fight. Um, so he was, he was just way off the mark and he didn't realize like, you know, he was training in an environment where it was just all on him um, previously. And obviously, world-class puncher, so he's probably knocking out guys in the gym and feeling like he's invincible. But there's a huge difference between like domestic level heavyweights and world-class level heavyweights. It's the, probably the biggest difference in margin in all divisions because there's so little room for error. Um, so like when he comes to me, I athletically, I mean, he'd been boxing since he was like seven years of age, I think it was. So, you know, we we worked on he knew how to throw a jab. He knew how to tuck himself in on a jab. You know, he was a phenomenal puncher, as I said, but like mm. it was all coming out very labored and there was no feints and there was no head movement and things like that off it. And because he was biomechanically set up a specific way, but I felt like we did a lot of that work in the gym and, you know, he bogged down uh, Danu. He, Knocked him out in a round and a half. Joey Casamano, he knocked him out in 30 seconds. Trevor Bright knocked him out in a round and a half. Like, and then he got, you know, he had that Kevin Lorena fight, which went like four rounds, but he literally nearly severed his ACL. He had about 3% of his ACL remaining intact after that. Uh, just like, like when he hyperextended his knee, still got the win. So, you know, we didn't get a chance to really showcase what, because he didn't, he wasn't in there with, I mean, Kevin Lorena's a decent opponent, but like he wasn't in there with a world class opposition. Um, so, you know, he's got that inner belief now because he's had a good few wins. Like he was still knocked from the Joyce loss when he was in the gym and then he went and got beaten by Usyk. But the, there was a turning point between, you know, Usyk and uh, Gerald Miller. Like when he, when he stopped Gerald Miller, like there was, they were exhausted after five rounds, the two of them. But then he came through and he stopped him. And then he carried that confidence over, like into the Hergovic, um, or Hergovic, I keep getting it wrong, everyone fucking screams at me for saying it, uh, Hergovic fight. And uh, that was his biggest win, do you know what I mean? Like AJ as well was a fantastic win. But yeah, I mean, it's 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 good to see, I'm happy to see it. I, I advise when, when uh, Stan and Daniel were parting ways, you know, because I was continuing to train Caroline, they asked me, asked me, you know, Frank Warren was adamant. He said, I'm, you know, he wants that Frank Warren wants Daniel to go to Ben Davison. And the dad said, what do you think, Shane? And I said, I think that's the wrong move. I think you should go to Don Charles because he's used to training heavyweights. Um, he's going to give a lot of time to you. And he is um, a senior person. And for Daniel, like he has so much respect and time for his dad, who's a senior man. He's 63 years of age. Don's similar age. And I worked that out that, you know, when, when my dad was in the gym, Hall of Famer, former world champion, Daniel would be a bit more responsive. So I was like, okay, this is what he needs. And he needs that. He doesn't need someone to teach him how to throw a jab, defend a jab or move his head. Like 
you can do that to the you can you can spend hours on hours on end trying to get Daniel to do that and he can do it but then he might like Ogovic like he got hit with plenty of right hands because he switches off and he just mentally switches off at times um and that's his vulnerabilities but then like you know um he yeah he needs that he needs to be able to come back and have that belief in his team and in his corner to say like okay like I'm doing it for them and you know, these people are like they get me and they understand like that seek and destroy mentality like that's what Don said is seek and destroy and you know when you get Daniel Dubois in that mindset he's a he's a nightmare um, he's a handful for any any heavyweight on the planet which is what I've always been saying it's just that you know it's just he's now doing it on the on the biggest stage possible. He does seem to draw a lot of strength from his dad being in the corner now. It seems to, I don't know if it's like an extra bit of G and him on or whatever it is, but with that working the way it is, is that something like from a trainer's perspective, like you don't change, you just keep that going if it's, if it's working? Well, it was funny because when he was in the gym with myself, um, it, was at a, it was at a stage in his life where I feel like he needed to grow. So I had conversations with the dad and I said, if you don't change his mentality now, he'll never change. Like he'll never grow up and he'll never take responsibility or ownership for anything. And, you know, simple tasks that you go through life, like, you know, going to a shop, paying, you know, paying with your phone or paying, you know, just little things like that. If everything's bought for you or if you get in a car and you get driven everywhere, like you just, you're programmed to fight and this is a mission and it's like, that's what you need to do. But like, you have to also go up Mm. And like he got his driving license when he was in the gym, yeah. You know, he did a lot of he did a lot of grow, growing in the gym, uh, not just from a boxing standpoint, but like from a you're surrounded by different different kids, um, and interacting because I know previously before like Bowers and he had really Daniel. He was like putting his full focus in, and Daniel trained on his own and in, in in that in that time, uh, whereas he was surrounded. I know you've seen stable, but he was surrounded by the group of us, and we were you know, getting him as inclusive as possible. And like now he's probably found that balance where, yeah, he has independence, but he also, um, he also has that security and support system of his dad, Don, Don's team. And that's, that's fitting, you know, it's working for him. So um, I'm, I'm happy for them all, you know, especially Don Charles because you know, it's his first world champion. He's been in the game 20 years and he rang me last night actually for, for a good 20 minutes. We had a good chat. He said, oh, it's a bit awkward. I said, no, Don, it's not awkward because at the end of the day, like, we, cho we we decided to go this path and that's just the way it is. Like, yeah, monetary-wise, but, like, I, I'm in this sport because I love it, you know, and I want to be able to, like, look in the mirror when I'm, you know, 20 years down the line and be like, okay, you stuck to your morals and you stuck to doing what you, you know, you, what you set out to do. Um, and And, you know, I feel like Don deserves the opportunity that he got when it comes to working with a great a great athlete like um like Daniel and and they've been a great fit and I think they should continue and stay on that fit for for good I mean that's a it's exactly what Daniel needs do you think Don will get the credit that he deserves from the industry yeah but I mean he should do because you know he's not going to be the right fit for everybody um but he's the right fit for Dan so and at, at the end of the day, like, Customato, was he the right fit for everyone? No, he was the right fit for, for Tyson. Do you know what I mean? So that's because he was a mentor. That's, that's what certain people need. Um, and that's, that's what's been the best fit for Dan. And, uh, you know, and I think, um, yeah, it's, just, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good combination. What about for the future for Dan? I think he deserves a big opportunity and maybe has one eye on the winner of Usyk versus Fury too. But mm. uh, maybe if he takes a fight in the meantime or looks to seek for that fight, what do you think is on the horizon for him? There's potential banana skins for Dan um, throughout the division. Um, so, but it's, that's the case for any heavyweight. It'll be the case for AJ. It'll be the case for Zile Zhang. There's, there's potentially like it doesn't matter how good they are. Like there's always going to be fights that you think maybe not um so yeah it's it's i think i mean i've got i've got a bit of stick to say i think aj and him should run it back because 
I think they should. I mean, if AJ wants to continue in the sport, I think, you know, it would be the right move for him to do that. And it's also the right move for Daniel Dubois because he gets the money that he deserves. Like that, that's the biggest, that's the biggest payday for him because it's still going to sell out Wembley if they did it again. If they did it in Riyadh, it will sell, it will sell there. Um, and that's, you know, that's monetary wise the, the best the best opportunity for him potentially to wait for you know the winner of Usyk versus Fury. But if I, if it was me, I'd say to him like, yeah, go with that with that one again, and then also try and get the winner afterwards. Um, and if he doesn't win the rematch, then he's got a third fight with AJ, and it's even, it's even better. Just on that. 